forces on point charges. Force on a point charge. Let's say we have a uniform electric field E. And somewhere in the middle of that field is a positive charge Q. It turns out, and we learned this through observation, that this electric field will put a force on that positive charge. And it turns out for positive charges, that force will be in the same direction as the applied electric field. So we can write an equation for this. The force F equals the charge Q times the electric field that that charge resides in. And then we calculate the force. It's a vector quantity and it has units of Newtons. So for this reason, the electric field intensity is most closely associated with force. So that's why when we're doing force calculations, we'll use the electric field intensity. So positive charge, the force is in the same direction as the electric field. And we can generalize this a bit. If we have a negative charge, then the force will be in the opposite direction of the electric field. Let's do a quick example just to start get a feel for the numbers. Let's say we have two metal plates. It's a parallel plate capacitor, for example, separated by one centimeter, and we apply 10 volts between those plates. What is the force on an electron that's located between those two metal plates? Well, my solution is always going to start the same. I'm going to sketch the problem. So we have a voltage supply, 10 volts, and that is applied to these two metal plates shown in gold here. The two plates are separated by a distance of one centimeter. We have an electron somewhere in the middle of these plates. And because we've applied a voltage, we get an electric field between those plates. And the electric field will go from the high voltage to the low voltage. So in fact, the the electric field will be in the negative Z direction if we're defining up and down here as the Z direction. So let's go ahead and calculate the electric field intensity. It is in the negative Z direction. So we put a negative and this uh, A hat Z unit vector in the Z direction. But the magnitude is the applied voltage divided by the separation between the plates. So we can plug our numbers in there and we get minus 1,000 volts per meter. And the minus is to remind us it's actually in the negative Z direction. Well, now that we have the electric field intensity, we can calculate the force on an electron using F equals QE. So in this case, Q is the charge of a single electron. That is a negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulombs. And then we also put in our electric field intensity. We turn the crank and we end up with 1.6 times 10 to the minus 16 Newtons in the positive Z direction. Now I don't like 10 to the minus 16 kind of units. I like to write this a little bit more cleanly in the final answer. So 160 atto Newtons in the positive Z direction is the final answer. So atto Newtons, that's incredibly small. That's sort of amazing. Coulomb's law. Up to this point, we've seen two things. In previous videos, we saw that charges have electric fields around them. And in this video in the beginning, we saw that if we have an electric field, it will put a force on a charge that resides in that electric field. So now if we have two charges, then the field due to one charge will put a force on the other. A charge cannot put a force on itself, so it takes two charges here. So using what we've learned, we'll derive an equation for the force on charge one due to charge two, and the equation that we derive is what's called Coulomb's law, the force on one charge due to the presence of a second charge. So let's say we have two charges. Well, the second charge creates an electric flux density D2. And we're writing the form of the expression that I think is most convenient for calculations, but not necessarily the most intuitive due to this cubed term here. Let's not think that this actually decays with one over R cubed. We talked about that in a previous video. 
since we're interested in the force on Q1, and that involves electric field intensity, we have to calculate the electric field intensity from the electric flux density. So E2, the electric field intensity due to the second charge, is simply the electric flux density D2 divided by the permittivity. Then last, the force on that first charge due to the electric field put off by the second charge is F21. And notice the subscript convention here, 2, 1. So that's the force due to charge 2 onto charge 1. So at this point, we'll take our first equation for D2. We will plug that into the second equation. And then we'll take that expression for E2 and plug it in down here. And we actually arrive at Coulomb's law. So what we've just done arrives at this second expression here. And as I mentioned, this is not the most intuitive expression, but it's great for calculations. A more intuitive one is this is the one that I would like us to program into our brains because it shows the one over R squared dependence and also the direction. So the second expression better for calculations and the first one much more intuitive. We can get a better feel for Coulomb's law by sketching the directions of the fields and the forces in a situation where we have two charges. So in each one of these four cases, we're going to want to sketch the force on the first charge due to the presence of the second charge. Well, in this case, the second charge is positive. So the electric field will diverge from it. So we have an electric field sort of pointing upper right. Now looking at the first charge, that's a positive charge. And so we know the force will be in the same direction as the electric field. So we can sketch the force on it in the upper right direction. Let's look at a second case here. Now we're making the second charge negative. Well, a negative charge has the electric field converging to it. So now the electric field is pointed to the lower left. Onto the first charge, the first charge is positive and the force is always in the same direction as the electric field. So the force is also now in the lower left direction. Onto the case where the first charge is negative and the second charge is positive. Starting first at the second charge, it's positive. So the electric field will diverge from it. So the electric field is pointing to the upper right. Looking at the first charge now, that is negative. The force will be in the opposite direction of the electric field. So the force, the force put on the first charge is in the lower left direction now. And last, let's suppose they are both negative charges. Looking first at the second charge, it is negative the electric field will converge to it. So the electric field is now pointing to the lower left. The first charge is negative. This means the force on it will be in the opposite direction as the electric field applied to it. And since the electric field is pointing lower left, the opposite direction is upper right. Let's end this with some notes about Coulomb's law. First, the direction of the force is along the line joining the two charges. So if we take the two positions and subtract them, we can calculate a vector in that direction. Divide by that magnitude, we'll have a unit vector in that direction that we can use in our calculations. Second observation, the force is directly proportional to Q1 times Q2. So the magnitudes of both of the charges contribute to force the same. Force is inversely proportional to R squared. So as we move these charges apart, the force will decrease as one over R squared. And then the last thing, the charges have to be stationary for these equations to be valid. If they're moving, it's not so much that the equations are not valid, but it becomes a little bit more complicated. We have to look at those equations more as the instantaneous force. And then we get differential equations and we have to solve that. And that is actually something we'll do later in the course.
let's finish off our discussion of Coulomb's law with an example and something that's maybe kind of interesting. Let's calculate the attractive force between the electron and a proton in a hydrogen atom. So our solution as always, it starts off by sketching the problem. So I drew the essentially the Bohr's model of an atom, which looks at the electrons as if they're orbiting in a circular or spherical pattern around the nucleus. We'll have a positively charged nucleus due to a proton and a negatively charged electron. And of course the charge is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. The electron has a negative charge and the proton has a positive charge. And looking this up online, the radius of a hydrogen atom is around 53 picometers. So that's roughly the separation between the two charges. Close enough for this example. So we write Coulomb's law, and then we start plugging in our numbers. We know our two charges. We know the, the free space permittivity, 8.854 times 10 to the minus 12 farads per meter. And assuming this is in vacuum, the dielectric constant is 1.0. And if we're analyzing something at the atomic scale, it's really not possible to have any other kind of material there. So that must be 1.0. And then the distance is 53 picometers. So we apply our calculator to this and we get up with a minus 8.19 times 10 to the minus eight in the radial direction, Newtons. And I really don't like numbers like this in our final report of the answer. So let's figure out the units a little bit better. And it turns out I think a convenient unit is 82 nano newtons. Notice I dropped the negative sign and depending on our, our directions, if that's important to us, we'd have to give that some thought, but we're just calculating the attractive force. And so we ignore the sign and just report this as 82 nano newtons. So at least at the size scale of our bodies, that is not a very big force at all. Coulomb's law for multiple point charges. Due to superposition, this is going to work exactly like we were calculating the electric flux due to multiple charges. We will look at each charge one at a time and calculate the force due to it. So in this case, we have a charge Q naught and we would like to calculate the force on this charge due to the presence of all the other charges. And so we will go one at a time, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, and calculate the force due to each one, add them all up, and we have the overall force. Here we're drawing the electric field intensity throughout this entire problem space due to that first charge. We're not going to put numbers to it here. We're just going to illustrate how we would apply Coulomb's law to multiple charges. So we calculate the field due to the first charge, and then we apply Coulomb's law to calculate the force on Q naught. We'll move to the second charge. Now the field is converging to it because it's a negative charge. We calculate that force. We then move on to the third charge. Field is diverging, calculate the force due to that. And finally, the fourth charge, which is converging because it's a negative charge and calculate the force due to that. Well, in the end, we've just calculated four different forces as if each one of those charges, Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4 were alone. When we add all of these together, we will get an overall force on that zero charge, that Q sub zero. And now this can be very tedious to do, but it is very simple. We just calculate the force due to each separate charge individually and then add them up. So that is called superposition.